Beginning in the 1920s, psychiatrists embraced a new group of procedures that claimed to work by creating intentional damage to the brain. Monfred Sockel had this notion that he could kill just the bad brain cells, that somehow we have good brain cells, we have bad brain cells. So if you give people enough insulin, you kill those bad brain cells. And if the person survived this epilepsy, they would be better off for it. Despite severe convulsions and an insulin shock death rate of 5%, Sockel pointed to his patient's childlike state and declared his treatment a success. Hospitals built insulin shock wards and coma therapy became big business. Not to be outdone, Ladislaus von Meduna of Hungary believed he could drive out mental illness by inducing brain damaging seizures with a drug called metrazole. He noticed his epileptics had no mental health problems and his mental health patients, his uh, psychiatric patients, seemed to have no epilepsy and so he thought doing one would obviate the other. The theory was that epilepsy and schizophrenia couldn't coexist in the same brain and that if epilepsy was induced, that a seizure was caused, it would, quote, drive out the schizophrenia. There's no scientific basis for this whatsoever. Metrazole was fast and lucrative. In a morning, a single psychiatrist could chemically shock 50 patients into a docile and manageable state. By 1939, metrazole was so popular with psychiatrists and staff, it was used in 70% of American hospitals and in almost every other country in the world. The financial success of insulin and metrazole sparked the development of an even more profitable method of inducing brain-damaging convulsions. How is electric shock therapy done? We use these electrodes. We place them on the patient's head like this. And then by means of this machine, we place a controlled electric current through the brain. Just for a fraction of a second. The patient doesn't feel it. The story behind this miracle cure began in a Roman slaughterhouse. In Italy, in 1938, uh, two uh, Italian psychiatrists decided to observe that before slaughtering pigs, in order to make the pigs more docile, they would apply electrodes to their temples that were hooked up to wall current, and uh, that this stunned the pigs, but it didn't kill them. And they could then slaughter them. Well. This gave them the encouragement to try inducing convulsions with electricity. We would see teeth falling out, broken spines, bones knocked out of joint, broken bones, and people even getting internal organ damage from being restrained while they were having these uncontrolled, writhing seizures, convulsions. Many patients have been returned to their homes and jobs who might still be here if it were not for this helpful form of treatment. Having successfully sold brain damage as a cure, psychiatrists search for even more precise ways of targeting the brain. This was jump-started in 1848, when an explosion blew a steel rod straight through the head of Vermont railway worker Phineas Gage. While Gage survived, his personality was dramatically altered. Seventy years later, Portuguese neurologist Igaz Moniz would try to obtain a similar result by drilling into a patient's skull and squirting pure alcohol directly into the brain killing the tissue of the frontal lobes. Moniz called this new procedure a lobotomy. Dr. Walter J. Freeman would become lobotomy's most infamous practitioner. He discovered he could do it faster without having to drill through the skull. There was no anesthesia, and he would just lift up the eye and stick uh, nothing more than an ice pick right into the brain, right under the orbital bone, and then just break the thing back and forth until he was satisfied that he had caused enough disruption of brain tissue and then pull it out. Freeman traveled the country in his Lobotomobile, 
hacking apart his patients' brains on stage, or sometimes right there in the vehicle. And he would pull up and offer lobotomies to people, get referrals from the local doctors, or sometimes people didn't even go through doctors. They'd go right to the lobotomobile, and he would just do the brain damaging procedure right there. By the time his surgical privileges were revoked after his last patient died on the operating table, Freeman had performed or supervised over 3,500 lobotomies, more than 25% of which, by his own admission, left his patients in a vegetative state. They lobotomized a million people in the 40s and the 50s and beginning of the 60s until they came to the conclusion that this was a destructive treatment. But though the stories of miraculous cures were soon exposed as brain-damaging frauds, psychiatrists kept one step ahead, inventing new forms of psychosurgery passed off as medical advances. I completely shudder from head to toe. And that's what I heard in my head when he, when he drilled something in my, in my brain. Northwest, actually, of the center home. Sorry, I have to do that. Yeah, why did you have to do that? I went, oh, funny, you know. Did you? My head all shook inside. Oh, dear. Oh, my head shook inside. Yes, so all right. right. Everything shook, my eyes, everything, my chest. Oh, that's all right. That was grievous bodily harm done to my brain. Mm -hmm. And nobody has the right anyway to play God with somebody's brain. The whole operation took about eight and a half hours and they kept me awake for every second of it. And I remember every second of it. And I still remember it to this day because I have this operation every day of my life. Whether I like it or not, I have it. Psychiatrists still tout the benefits of psychosurgery, a treatment that earns them $3.1 million annually. But in the wake of lobotomy's tarnished reputation, psychiatrists were quick to push electroshock back into the spotlight. Renaming it electroconvulsive therapy, they now give patients anesthetics to squash their screams and paralyzing agents to avoid watching the writhing of agony. The main misconception that people have about ECT is that it's new and improved. The new and improved refers strictly to these uh, cosmetic improvements because, in fact, they make it easier on the witnesses. The person isn't shaking all over the table. It paralyzes them. It isn't new. It isn't improved. It is worse. Every 10 years or so, there tends to be, uh, first of all, a denial that it causes any harm. Secondly, an acknowledgement that it might have caused harm, but here's a whole new approach, and now this one is blameless without any research to back it up. The ECT machine can pr produce anywhere from 50 to 400 volts. It's the kind of energy that we use for industrial machinery that might be in a steel mill or, some, or a printing press, some large piece of machinery. It's an extraordinary amount of energy and it causes a great deal of damage. And while stories of prisoners physically mistreated with electroshock are well publicized, the amount of voltage doled out by psychiatrists for ECT is up to 33 times greater. And that damage is most often targeted at the most vulnerable. Two thirds of those who receive electroshock are women. Given such diagnoses as premenstrual syndrome, menopausal disorder, or postpartum depression. Half of electroshock patients are elderly. Once they become eligible for government health care at age 65, twice as many American seniors receive ECT than at age 64. And what does this all add up to? 100,000 dead and countless others so brain damaged they have no hope of ever recovering a normal life. For a total of $12 worth of electricity, psychiatrists in the United States alone rake in $1.2 billion. But the next miracle cure psychiatrists added to their arsenal made them more money than ever before. For it was faster, cheaper, and could potentially turn men, women, and children into patients for life. <laughs>